This is The Jay Show, and this is Dr. Jay Smith here in London, and I have Hatun Tosh with me back again. Hello, Jay. Thanks for having me again. We've been having a good time, haven't we, as we've been looking through and unpacking the historical difficulties with the Quran. Yeah. And the reason we're doing this, Hatun, is because we want to ask the questions that have yet to be asked. Yeah. What are those questions? Uh, so, is we look, we kind of trying to answer the we are trying to answer the question, the names and places and people are mentioned in the Quran, do they fit the historical line? And we come to the conclusion, actually, no. Quran, author of the Quran fails to know the timeline for those people and then get confused with the events. Let's go to Solomon and Sheba. Here's another. Now, this is a great story, and this is a story I wish I had had in Sunday school, uh, the, what they have in the Quran. Is that because it's funny for bedtimes? It is. It's very entertaining. I'd love to see it animated. You have Solomon. He's training his bird, and we'll put it up on the screen there, Surah 27, verses 17 to 44. He's training his birds, getting them ready for battle. The first Air Force ever invented there by Solomon. I didn't know that. That's Why wasn't I told this? <laughs> That's an amazing study in the Quran. Actually, yeah. They fly up over the enemy and they drop stones onto the enemy. On the bottom of every stone is the name of the enemy they're going to kill. I didn't know that. That's another new one that I would love to have heard about. The first bombers in history are there in the story of Solomon and Sheba. There is one bird that's missing, however, and when he is marching them, getting them ready for battle, the hoopoe bird. You know why it's called the hoopoe bird? Explain it to us, Jay. Because go hoopoo, hoopoo. That's how it sounds. So it's basically the name of what 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 it uh, what it sounds like. I grew up with hoopoo birds. We had them where I grew up. And then this hoopoo bird, his favorite bird is missing. He's not marching with the other birds, so he gets angry. Where is my hoopoo bird? And then he sees it flying from the south, and it lands at his feet, and he talks to the birds. Now hold on a minute. Did you know that Solomon could talk to birds? Oh, and when you look at the Quran, you see everything talks in the Quran. So I'm not that much surprised. Do you know he talks to ants? I'm not that surprised, Jay. This yeah. is after the Bible had already been compiled. This is after the Bible had been canonized. We then find this story. It is nothing more than a bedtime story for children. Yeah. So it's a lovely story. It's uh, make people laugh, but it's not in the Bible yet. It is as part of the eternal word of Allah. So they say. And it is man-made man story and end up in the eternal word of Allah as the confirmation for the previous books or correction for the previous books. What's interesting is um, it does copy almost the story word for word except for the ending. If you look at the second Targum of Esther, yeah. as the queen is walking across and it's just as she's lifting up her skirts to keep them from getting wet, she has hairy legs. And when Solomon so no sees the hairy legs, time. he cries out in surprise. Now, that's not in the Quranic account. They kept that out of the Quranic account for obvious reasons. But that proves to us that this is borrowed from that account. It is coming from a second century document that now we need to let's back up so people know what we're talking about. The Jews had to leave Jerusalem in 70 AD because Jerusalem was destroyed. Yeah. And when they left, they fled into the, what we call the diaspora. They went over into the east. Many of them went to the south. Many of them went into Arabia. They went as far as Stesiphon, which is well, the, what today is Baghdad. Yeah. And as they went, they took their scriptures with them, wrapped up in their scrolls. Those they would not let anybody else read. They were written in Hebrew. They kept in Hebrew. They didn't translate them. That's why the Hebrew accounts had not been translated for the Arabs to hear. Yeah. But when they had contact, as they were having contact with the people in the diaspora, they heard stories that were coming around. Many of them were great sounding stories like the Arabian Nights, the uh, Thousand and One Nights. They were hearing stories like Dual, uh, Dual Karnayn, these yeah. kind of stories. They were hearing about the suspended poems by Imr al-Qais. These are great stories that they were coming across. And they were bringing them in and they were bringing them for their children to listen to but what they would do is they put biblical names to these stories yeah so this was a typical story about a great man who had an air force of birds and who wanted to see the Queen of Sheba but they put Solomon's name and they put the Queen of Sheba in there to make it so that the children could understand it but they always were very careful not to let the children confuse which was the authoritative story yeah. that are in Hebrew and these ones that were then recounted in the vernacular. Vernacular means into the language that people would understood there. So hold on a minute, am I right to understand even in the uh, J Jews who moved to the Baghdad, they knew what is the part of the ba scripture, what is not the part of the scripture. Absolutely. And they were teaching their children in, in that way. Why is it they didn't know which were the real stories? Because it's a man-made book. No, no, no. There's a historical reason. Because this book had not yet been translated. Yeah. 
This book was but, not translated into Arabic. Yeah, if you look at if you look at the side that Quran is as a revelation comes from Allah, it again questions the knowledge of Allah. If it is the word of Allah, but we see it's not word of Allah. It is man-made book, and those men didn't have access to the scripture. They so didn't they have access confused. to the real scripture. All they had access were these apocryphal accounts that they were getting from the Jews, yeah. thinking that that's the Jews were telling them authentic stories. The earliest New Testament that we have now been now discovered in just the last year is found in Mount Sinai, in the uh, Saint Catherine's Monastery. It's known as the, Sine the, the, the Codex of Sinai 151. As a translation? That's no? the earliest translation we have found. Look at the date on it. And the date is 687. I'm sorry, so 867. That's late 9th century. Late 9th century, they finally got the New Testament translated into Arabic. And what's fascinating is when you look at that, you can see then they didn't even know what the New Testament yeah. or the Old Testament. So they only had these stories to go on. And it's these stories that get incorporated into the Quran, like yeah. Solomon and, she and Sheba, like Cain and Abel. Yeah, again, we see stories are not in the Bible, ends up in the Quran, written by people as part of the Islamic scripture. Let's go to the New Testament, because here we find Jesus in the palm tree in Surah 19, Ayah 22. We'll just put it up on screen real quickly. Yeah. Uh, there you find Jesus, and what is he doing? Well, he's he's there um, with his, his mother. mother. Yeah. She's just had per, be, uh, pains of childbirth, and she's under the trunk of a uh, trunk of a palm tree. She cries out in ang anguish, and what happens? Baby Jesus, the infant Jesus, talks to her and tells her. The baby Jesus cried unto her from below her, saying, Grieve not, this is Jesus speaking, for thy Lord hath provided a rivulet. He's saying, look at over here, here's where the stream is. Yeah. And shake the tree towards thyself in the trunk of the palm tree, and it will all fall fresh ripe dates. Here's a little baby telling his mother how to eat. Here's yeah. a little baby telling his mother where the water's coming from. Beside Should it that, be the other way around? Beside that, um, as a Christian, we read, we read our scripture. Can you just tell me which part of the Bible you read this story, Jay? Never. I miss this in Sunday school again. Boy, I had a terrible Sunday school. I didn't hear this story about Jesus yeah. and the baby. There, she, he's just been born, and he's telling his mother not only where the water is, but how to shake the tree. Yeah. How does he know about shaking trees? It's, Since when did he have that kind of experience? It's again with great sadness that Quran puts the stories in itself which are man-made. Okay, how do you know it's man-made? Wait a minute, you ain't man-made. What do you mean? How do you know that? Uh, well, we can chase back and then we can see where we read these stories. And the then it comes same story from comes from the last books of the Bible, again, written lost in the second century. Yeah. In the second century AD, yeah. you have this story appearing almost exactly like that. There is the baby yeah. talking to Mary. This is a Gnostic writing. The Gnostics did not consider, did not believe that God could take on human form. And that's why they had to give all these great stories of yeah. his childhood. And they had a whole litany of these childhood stories of Jesus. Uh, we see many of these. Look at the next slide. Look at these Christian sources, these writings that come in in Surah 3, Ayah 33 to 35, Mary, Imran, and Zechariah. Yeah. They've got Mary, he's got the wrong father. Yeah. And then you have Surah 3, Ayah 49, Jesus making birds out of clay and blowing on them. I didn't know he could do that. The way Allah does, remember, Jesus creates the world the way Allah does. Ah, then Surah 531, we get that Surah 7, 171, and Surah yeah. 19, we talked about these already. Yeah. But in this case, Jesus is talking as a baby. Yeah. These are all written in Syriac. Yeah. They're all written. And they're all written in, in and from second century. Second century yeah. and on. So, so long after the Bible had already been yeah. canonized. So Christians and Jews never took that as part of their scripture, yet uh, uh, author of the Quran puts those stories in itself as the part of the scripture. Remember, Quran came to confirm the previous revelation, yet we read the stories which are man-made into the Quran. You That's know, great sadness, actually. One of the best things, um, Muslims always come to me and say, no, 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 this cannot be man-made because look at the gorgeous poetry. Look at the poetry in the Quran. How could my man who could not read and write, write such great poetry? Have you, you've heard that claim, haven't you? Yeah, I hear that c claim, and then I'm just like confused. I look at the biography of Muhammad, and then I see Muhammad was the enemy for the people who write and say the poem. 
Well, let's take it on board. There is That's beautiful, be I would agree with him, there is beautiful poetry there. And if you hear the Azam and you hear the, the Muezzin uh, on a Friday, yeah. it, it, for people who have grown up with that, they get used to it and they love the poetry that is there. And I say, okay, let's say this is, this is very poetic, I agree, that, but have you n looked back and seen where that poetry comes from? Now, two scholars have done that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Gunther Luling, who's a yeah. friend of mine, in fact, we actually commissioned him to actually write his book on this. He had spent many years, he is a, an expert in Syriac, that is his whole area of expertise. He is a German scholar yeah. in the Syriac. Uh, Dr. Luxemburg, that's not his real name. Uh, he has also done, independently of Dr. Gunther Luling, two different scholars, yeah. independent of each other, did their research on the Syriac writings. And the reason they did this is that they had studied Syriac documentation. They had gone through all the 5th and 6th century Syriac writings. And when Dr. Gunther Luling was looking at this poetry that's in the Quran, this supposed miracle of the Quran that Muslims claim, he they, noticed they that he'd heard these before. From the, it was stolen from other writings. How did he know that? Well, he went back to his Syriac documents and he found a whole corpus of Christian hymns written in the 5th and 6th century, written in Syriac, when he looked at them and put them alongside the poetry in the Quran, they were almost exactly the same, strophe for strophe the same. He said, these have just been stolen. Yep. These are nothing more than Christian hymns yep. written by Christians in Syriac in the 5th and 6th century, interposed into the Quran. The, if you want to give credit to the beauty of, those, yep. of that poetry, give credit to who it was due. Give yep. credit to the Christians that wrote it. I'm not don't give credit to Allah and don't give credit to Muhammad. I'm not surprised. I'm just, again, disappointed because stories, stylists, which were exist before Muhammad, end up in the Quran as the part of the part of word of Allah. Claimed as part of the, part word, of of the word of Allah. And again, it confirms it is just man-made book. It has nothing to do with the Allah because, or creator because He's, he's supposed to be all wise and clever guy, yet he fails to put that in practice. Okay. Just again, confirms man-made book. And we know that because we've now gone through three different criticisms. Yeah. The first criticism is that it was compiled compare. by man. This yeah. is not compiled by God. It was compiled willy-nilly. It was there. They had to eradicate Uthman. And we're just using what the um, al-Buhari, chapters uh, volume 6, 509 and 510 say. Yeah. So it was compiled willy-nilly, it was uh, destroyed by man, it yeah. was then sent out by man, it was then ma uh, uh, put all over the, the w known world by yeah. man. Uh, we then looked and we noticed that it had all kinds of man-made errors, yes. what yeah. we call historical anachronisms. Only man would make these kind of errors. And then we noticed that it was also borrowed by man yeah. from other men's writings. Yeah. This, in case, uh, Jewish apocryphal writings and Christian, uh, also sectarian writings and also Christian poetry. Yeah. All man-made. It's all man-made. Now we get to probably the biggest thing and where we're going to spend most of our time. Yeah. Let's go then to the fourth problem. And this really shows that it's man-made. Let's put it up on the screen there. And what you see here is manuscript criticism. Now we're going to get back to the, the what Muslims, uh, this is the, probably the most damaging part for Islam. This is the new material. And much of what you're going to see now for the next few episodes, no one, you have not seen before. This is all new material, Hatun. Um, Why? We could say, we can say in one sense it's new, but we know history up, updates itself very quickly, so now they become old material. <laughs> but it's new for lots of Muslim world. I didn't know this when I started. I've been working in the Islamic world for 35 years. We didn't have this material when I started Yeah, but out. it's been like five years and then all those materials updated. So you're now. very young yet. You think this is old. But let, look at me. I've got gray hair. I should know what I'm talking about. When I started out, you weren't even born. When I started out in working in Islam, you had yet to be... Okay, you're now showing your age. But most people who are watching this yeah. had not been born. And when I started out, we never had what we're going to yeah. introduce now. What we're going to introduce now, for those who are watching, this material, I think, is the Achilles heel of Islam. This has been good looking at source criticism. This has been good looking at how it was compiled. These are good questions we've been asking about historical anachronisms. That's good that we have that. And that's been around. St. Clair Tisdale was talking about what we've just introduced back in the 1800s. Yeah. That is old. What we're not going to introduce, I have never saw this when I was learning Islam. When I did my master's, I never came across this material. Yeah. We never knew what we're going to introduce now. You're now going to benefit from the no most recent research that's just been put out. Yeah. 
by the German school, by the European school, and by certain Americans. And but also some of them by Muslims. Also by Muslims. In fact, the most damaging material that we're going to introduce is by two Muslim scholars that is now being adopted by other Muslims, thankfully. And this is probably why Muslims who are watching this, this is what you're going to have to deal with. Because the claims are there. And let's look at the claims. Let's start with the claims, yeah. looking at it. And Hutton, why don't you go back? What are the four the, claims that yeah, they always make? Yeah, let's just remember them. So Muslim makes a claim that Quran is the eternal. It's eternal. Now, where yeah, does that come they, from? They will look at the exegesis for the Surah 85, verse 22. So chapter 85, verse 22, it talks about the preserved the tablets. tablets. And, and every then when you look at the outside sources, it is the eternal tablets. Commentaries always talk about this yeah. is the eternal yeah. reference. So the Quran is uncreated. Yeah. And it was sent down by an, uh, to Angel Jebrail to Muhammad. Over a period of 22 uh, years. Yeah. So eternal, sent down. It was compiled in perfect form under the Uthman. So in the third, third but mid-7th century, yeah. around 650, 652, it was compiled completely. Yeah. And then sent to the uh, different provinces as a complete form. And that Quran has been, is not, that Quran is not changed. So it's exactly the same Quran. This Quran we have our, in our hand today, the Arabic part, this yeah. part here, is unchanged. So just remember, if all of us watch, look at those four words. Let's look at those four words again. Those that you have in yellow and that are underlined. Eternal, sent down, complete, unchanged. unchanged. Those are the four claims they make, okay? Can you just remember those four claims? And when those of you who are talking to a Muslim friend, ask those four questions. Is it eternal? Is it sent down? Sent down? Was it complete? And is it unchanged? And then ask a fifth question. Number five, Prove it. Prove it. That's all you have to do. Two words. Prove it. Now, now, Hatun, they can't prove the first two. There's no way you can do prove yeah, a disprove. Eternality, you can't yeah. disprove that or, or, or prove it. Um, sent down, we're not there. We're not in the seventh century. We can't prove that or disprove it. Yeah. It's the next two claims, claims three and four. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at those two claims, yeah. complete and unchanged. Yeah. That's all you need. So what we're asking, what are we asking for here, Hatun, if we're saying complete and unchanged? What are we looking for? So we are looking at Quran, which is dated in the time of Uthman. So first of all, a Quran, one. We're not, one we're not, we should be able to find nine. Yeah. We would be happy with just one, right? Yeah. We are looking at one Quran. They, they show us one Quran, which dated 650s from Surah 1 to Surah 114, exactly the same. What okay, did you hear today. those claims? Say those again. We're looking for one, one Quran. One Quran. Which is from the 7th century, and dated, you've got to prove dated, it to us. Dated 650s. That shouldn't be too hard. Um, fr from Surah 1 to Surah 114. Complete. And unchanged. And it is unchanged. exactly the exactly. same Quran. Exactly. Word for word, yeah. line for line, Surah for Surah, exactly the same, 114 yeah. Surahs. That's what we're looking for. Yeah. We're looking for the, basically we're asking, yeah. if you can look at those last two claims, then we're going to ask you to prove those yeah. four. As we are looking at those claims, we are acknowledging, and Muslims are acknowledging, we already give up the Quran, which Muhammad received. We already give up the Quran, which uh, Abu Bakr compiled. We are looking at the second compiled perfect Quran. The second recension is the name yeah. they call it, the Uthmanic recension. We yeah. want just one Uthmanic recension. That's yeah. all we're asking. We're not asking for much. Yeah. Because this is the they seventh should century. They able to show it to us because they had non-perfect copies. Listen, we have three uh, Bibles, New Testaments that are complete. Two right here in London and one in Rome that we can give you from 300 to 200 years earlier. Can you come up with one, just one from the seventh century that's complete and unchanged because you're making that claim. We're and not making that claim, yeah. you are making that claim. As a claim. Christian, we never make a claim that we've got the complete, perfect Bible from the time we of Jesus. We would never make these four claims, yeah. except for because number three. Because we know we were under the persecution, and we know we weren't able to, uh, our manuscripts weren't able to survive. We were poor and persecuted. Yet, it is Muslims who makes the claim that we've got the exactly perfect Quran from 650s, and what we are reading today, it's unchanged. Okay, let's put that slide back up there again. Uh, just take a look at that slide. Would we say that the Bible is eternal? No. We say Jesus is the no, eternal. No, 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 you're, you're jumping ahead now. I'm just saying the Bible now. Is no. the Bible eternal? No. Was the Bible sent down? No, we would not make that claim. Uh, is it, was it complete? Yes. That's the only claim that we would say it was complete in its original t uh, form. And has it been changed? Yeah, it's been changed. We know where it's been changed. So we are openly, we would not make these four claims except number three. But can you see, 
Muslims are making these four claims. So that's what we're going to do now. We're not going to look at it. Now, we're not talking about translations. If you put up there, you can see there's 106 English translations. We're not talking about translations at all. Yep. We're not talking about, um, in fact, we're, 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 we're going to go look and we're going to ask what the experts say. Let's just look through what the experts say. This is not translation. What do they say? This is what they say. Uh, here you have Fethullah Gulen, and he says there's only one Quran. And we'll just keep these slides up as we go. And then you get to Suzanne Hanif, who Suzanne said, Hanif says that it's preserved in its original form. This is her claim. Preserved to the present time in its exact original form is what she quotes. Uh, now we move on to Jamal al-Din uh, and Zara Bozo, who says that, it, that uh, to this day one can travel to any part of the world and pick up a copy of the Quran and find it is the same throughout the world. So everywhere in the world you'll find the same Quran. Uh, then we go to Abdullah Yusuf Ali, who is one of the famous translators of the Quran. And he says the Arabic text we're not talking about translation. The Arabic text we have today is identical to the text as it was revealed to the prophet. Not even a single letter has yielded to corruption. That's what he's saying, Abdullah Yusuf Ali. We move on then to Zaid bin Sultan al Nahyan in the Humanitarian Foundation. And he says, not even a dot over the last 14 years has been changed. No variation. So he's giving even more. And then we have Malvi Muhammad Ali who says the Quran is one and no copy differing in even a dire critical point is met. That means the dots above and below the line. A manuscript with the slightest variation in the text is unknown. So these are huge claims. And then we'll end with this last one by Al-Hajj uh, Ade Ajijola, who says the Quran is fully preserved and not a jot or a tittle has been changed or left out. So those are good claims Muslims are making. Um, there is one thing common with those things, they are a lie, they are not true. How can they you can, prove that? They cannot support any of those claims. Muslims would disagree with those claims. Okay. Because they look at the manuscripts and then they see manuscripts all messed up and like... Hold on a minute. They did not disagree with these claims when I started this work, Hatun. I'm going to now predate you. When I began and when I came to London in 1992, these are the claims I would hear all the time. Actually, still in 2017, you will sit down with Muslim and then they will make the same claims. But some Muslim scholars cannot support those claims. Okay, and how anymore. do they know that? Well, let's just look at uh, Shabir Ali. Shabir Ali makes these two claims. Uh, he talks about the Ma'il Quran and he says that for 1300 years ago, we can compare that with what we are reading today and we find them to be exactly identical. So when did he make this claim, Jay? He made this claim actually with Tony Costa uh, in a debate that he did with Tony Costa in Toronto. I don't remember the year. It was probably about the 1990s that okay. he made this claim. Uh, more recently, he came, went on to say, the text of the Quran, because the text we know through memory work, and through the written materials handed down right from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, as I said, he goes on, the two copies that were made 1400 years ago, one which is in Tashkent, Russia, that's the Samarkand Sam Sam manuscript, yep. for example, has been demonstrated by Ahmed von Denfer in his book Ulub al Quran to be an early copy from that time, and we find no difference from that copy to what we're reading today. Now, why am I using Shabir Ali? Why is he so important? Um, Shabir, is, Shabir Ali is well known as Muslim apologist and polemist. Um, he has like he, he runs Dawa uh, centers and he has like, lots of Muslims follow him. He's one he's of the, he's considered their best debater. Yeah. And uh, certainly one of the best authority in the English speaking world. Yeah. And he's really the only one who actually debates historical critical yeah. analysis. And he's got very good mind, by the way. You like his mind, I know, yeah. Yeah, I do too. I mean, he's a good yeah. friend of mine. I and debated he's very him. gentleman, like when you compare with other Muslims. Especially the ones we get at Speaker's Corner every Sunday, or what I had last night uh, when I was over there in Forest Gate. Yeah. Uh, we, we, I got really pounced on for introducing the same material, but it was mostly emotional. And the reason yeah. why it's emotional is because Muslims, even here in London, have not dealt with what we're gonna deal with. Yeah. They have not looked at what we're gonna look at. Yeah. Shabi and Ali, back in the days when I started debating him, see, I started debating him back in 1997 was my first debate with him. 
We're now, that's 20 years ago. I've been debating Shabbat Yadah for 20 years. And my last debate was 2014. Now, in 2014, uh, I've come across some material in 2013, the year before, which we're going to introduce in the next episode. We won't get into it right now. But back then, I was introduced some new material that was mind-boggling to me. I had never come across this material in my studies at Fuller Seminary, Hatun. Uh, I had never come across my materi this material uh, in my studies at School of Oriental African Studies in 1994 when I was studying under Ger uh, Ger Dr. Hotting here. Yeah. Um, studying under Patricia Corona. She was my supervisor when I began my doctorate. I didn't hear this kind of material that she was coming across. Yeah. I had never heard this material and ne ne neither had no one else because back in the 1990s no one had really heard this, including Shabir Ali. It was only in the last few years, and we're going to go into this in the next episode, so I don't yeah. want to uh, steal my thunder out that. But this material started coming onto our plate a few years ago, just a, actually four or five years ago. And it was this new material that we're going to introduce in the next episode that was has proven to be the most devastating. And the yeah. reason why is for the first time, the same questions that have been asked against the Bible, the documentary yeah. hypothesis. That's a good, that was a good question that, that uh, the school, those in the Tubigan school were asking. You know, did Moses, could Moses have been the author for the five books of Moses when there's completely different genres of writing, when there's completely different names that are using for God, yeah. the Yahweh, the Priska, uh, the Yahweh, or the priestly code, how can that be the same author if he's using different names for God? Yeah. Uh, C.S. Lewis answered that very clearly and said, well, look at my writings. I write poetry, I write medieval literature, uh, I write novels, I write science fiction, uh, I write fantasy, yeah. and in every case, styles of writing are completely different, but I'm the same author. I'm still C.S. Lewis. That's quite normal, especially when you look and see what Moses was doing. So that has been leveled out. But those kind of questions, then the, the real question came back, well, what do we do with the earliest manuscripts? We don't have the earliest manuscripts for the we Old Testament. We don't have the original manuscripts for Why the not? Bible. Why not? Because um, they, it was practically, uh, they couldn't survive. They written on the papyrus. They, they and what's, written, what's wrong with papyrus? They don't survive. Why? They are the leaves. Okay. They don't. They don't survive. They need to be living in certain conditions. So they're interlocking leaves yeah. that are hammered down into made into a, a paper kind of form that can be written on. Yeah. And uh, when we look at the Christian history, we, even though we know many scripts traveled from one place to other place, but. All the uh, papyrus we find, they are in the li um, land of Egypt. So each climate of Egypt is capable to um, keep those manuscripts, like make them survive. Uh, the, but the manuscripts which end up in Turkey, end up in Rome, they couldn't survive because we were poor, we weren't able to write on the animal skins, we were writing on the leaves. Okay, so papyrus, papyrus. by definition is a poor man's paper. Uh, it was for the poor people, people who don't have a lot of wealth. Yeah. They would have to use papyrus, and papyrus disintegrates. It just gets dry and it just crinkles. Yeah. And that's why it, they only laugh about last about 100 years, yeah. and that's why copies need to be made yeah. of copies of copies. Animal skin is much more durable. Yeah, but uh, still there is a God's miracle in it because our earliest papyrus is dated 125 AD, which is 35 years after it is written down. It is amazing that it is very small piece, but it is amazing that it is survived. Okay, that's and the John in, Ryland's par parchment yeah, in the John bottom chapter of papyrus. 18, and it's like historical evidence regarding the Jesus is in front of the court. Okay, so we're getting now into manuscript evidence. We're going to have to stop this episode here, and we're going to pick it up with the next one. We're going to now move into the much more damaging material, probably the most damaging material we've ever come across, looking at the manuscript evidence for the Quran. We're going to ask the question, where are the Muslim, where are the earliest Quranic manuscripts? Do they exist? Can we look at them? Have they been uh, looked at? Is there been any forensic testing done on them? And the answer is yes to all of those. And we're going to see what we have now found. Stay with us. This is Jay and Hatun here in London. Over and out.